The, the, uh, the mealy bug is a, uh, has been a pest of cassava for many years, on, now on all three continents. First of all, in the Americas, where it was the origin of, the, of this particular pest, then it was introduced into Africa in the early 1970s, and it became a major pest problem in Africa. And then in around 2009, we found, 2008 actually, we found it for the first time in Thailand, where it has caused uh, severe crop damage to cassava over the last couple of years in Thailand. The, one of the major ways of controlling the mealy bug is through biological control. Unfortunately, we have a very effective parasite to do this. The origin of the parasite also is South America, was introduced into Africa, was very successful in reducing mealy bug uh, populations and damage in Africa. And then uh, the Thais reacted to the problem with the mealy bug very rapidly. Uh, once they realized what the species was, once we identified the species, uh, they introduced the parasite from Africa with the assistance of IIPA in this, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture based out in Nigeria. And uh, the Thais did a, a very good job on, first of all, getting the mealy uh, parasite into the country and then developing methodologies for mass rearing the mealy bug. And so they developed some very innovative methodologies for doing this. So they're able to mass rear the, uh, the mealy bug and the parasite, produce large numbers of the parasite, and the parasite was released then into cassava fields about a year or two ago. Uh, from what we know right now, this release has been very successful. The parasite has become established in the many of the cassava growing regions of Thailand where the mealy bug is a problem and it has reduced mealy bug populations very significantly. And from what we can tell at present is that the mealy bug is not really causing major damage to cassava. Okay, we hope that this will hold in the future. <coughs> FAO or FAO is going to have a, uh, a workshop the uh, end of the May, beginning of June of this year in Thailand and there will be uh, several other countries involved in this, China, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, um, um, let's see, Cambodia also will be involved in this uh, workshop where we'll be discussing whether or not uh, or just how much of a problem the mealy bug is uh, in these different countries. It has, we know that it has already uh, disseminated to, uh, to Cambodia. We're not sure yet, at least I'm not sure yet, be th if it has gotten to some of the other countries. It would be very interesting to see what the uh, country reports say about the mealybug situation in the different countries in, uh, in Asia. But eventually the mealybug will make it to these different countries. There's, there's uh, no doubt about that. I mean, it's spread very rapidly across the African continent and it will spread uh, very rapidly through many of the countries in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we just recently had a report now that there's a mealybug problem in Indonesia, so it all may, may have skipped to one of the island countries in, in the region. This hasn't been confirmed yet as to what species it is, but we do have at least photos of a mealybug uh, problem in Indonesia. So one of the things um, about this that's, that I think is very important also is that we hope that biological control is sufficient to control the mealybug and keep this down at a very low level where it is not really causing any economic damage. However, the experience in Africa and also what we are seeing in southern Brazil right now indicates that you still might have a 5 to 10 percent year loss even with the biological control, even though you have the, this major parasite present in the field. That may be a 5 to 10 percent may be acceptable under certain conditions. But when you have a high value crop, and that's what cassava has become in Asia and also in Brazil, for example, where it becomes somewhat of an industrial crop. Uh, and that 5 to 10 percent can translate to several millions of dollars. Okay? So that's not quite acceptable when you have a high value crop, even that 5 to 10 percent. So one of the things we have to look at, how can we even bring that level down even lower? So you basically have no yield loss. And so we have to think of this as not just a biological control program, but also as a pest management program, of which biological control is probably the major component. Okay, but we have to look at other ways of also 
reducing or maintaining the population at a very, very low level. This will include things like the, the selection of clean planting material, or taking your planting material from fields where there is no cassava mealybug outbreak, uh, the treatment of planting materials, what a chemical treatment prior to planting. Uh, may, may there are other ways of augmentating biological control so it might become more effective. And I think a lot of this will probably be discussed at this workshop that FAO is having uh, in Thailand at the end of this month or the beginning of June. I think this is a very timely workshop and, and I'm very glad that AI, uh, FAO has taken the initiative in doing this because I think we have to bring the pest problems on cassava, not just the mealybug but all of the pest problems that we might have on cassava to the attention of the cassava growing countries in the region in Southeast Asia. The mealybug is one of the pests. We also know that a green mite now has made its way from probably South America into, into Vietnam. We identified this in Vietnam about two years ago. So we have some mite problems that also to look at. And uh, there are white fly problems so forth. So we can't just think of this as just being a mealybug problem. We have to think about it as there are other pest problems, as well as there are several disease problems also. And there's the potential. In other words, if the mealybug was able to make it to Southeast Asia from, its, from Africa or from its original home in South America, then there are a lot of other types of pest, problem, pest and disease problems that might also make it into Southeast Asia. For example, in Africa, you have Africa cassava mosaic disease and you have brown streak virus. Both uh, appear to be white fly transmitted. Right? And these are potential problems that could make their way also into Southeast Asia. And this would have a very detrimental effect on cassava production in the region. So we have to consider some of these other pest problems as well as the mealybug. The fact that we have had success with the mealybug I think is very, very important. It indicates that we can control some of these major cassava pests. But one of the things that we have to be very vigilant about, and we have to really have good quarantine uh, strategies in place in these different countries, and I'm sure that will be taken up in this FAO uh, workshop. FAO has always been one of the promoters of good uh, quarantine uh, strategies. Uh, we have developed in the past strategies uh, for quarantine and for the movement of cassava, uh, making sure that you do not move vegetative material in the form of cuttings or stems or, or stem cuttings. Uh, this is one of the major ways that, uh, that disease and insect problems, pest problems, are transmitted or disseminated from one region to another region, from one continent to another continent. And so some strict quarantine uh, things have to be put into effect also. I'm sure that will be part of the workshop that we will be dealing with. So I think we have to look at what's happening in Asia in a sense that the honeymoon is over. Okay, For many years Asia did not really uh, experience many pest problems on cassava. Okay? Uh, there were in the Americas, center of origin of the crop, of course, we have several pest problems. Some of these made their way to Africa, and they have caused problems in Africa. And now they've made their way there, to Asia. So as I say, the honeymoon is over, and we have to really be vigilant about what's happening with pest and disease problems in Southeast Asia. Now, some people might say, <clears throat> with, with cassava being an industrial crop in Asia, and, and the fact that most of the cassava produced is chipped and dried and then and, and sent to China for use in, in biofuel. People might wonder, well, what's the link to the small farmers here? What's the, what's the link to, to rural livelihoods? Can you throw a bit of light on that? Yeah, this is an interesting aspect of it. We first thought of cassava many years ago when we started doing research as being basically a subsistence crop. And over the years, this has evolved into more of a, of a high value commercial crop and, and somewhat of an industrial crop. Um, a lot of this goes into chip production as you mentioned or into the starch production. A lot of it starch is also used in human foods. One of the interesting things about this is cassava, well, although in some areas you have large plantations, it basically remains a rather small farmer crop. 
Okay, now a lot of these small farmers are linked to the industries. We know this, we can see this in Brazil, and it's also in parts of Southeast Asia, and it'll happen also in Africa. What this does, that it brings in a lot of rural income. Cassava is grown in rural areas, okay, and the processing plants, the factories for processing cassava, is going to, they're primarily in rural areas, and they are staffed by a lot of people, and very often by a lot of women that work in a lot of these uh, starch-producing factories and so forth. And so what, what it does, cassava, it provides employment in the rural areas. And it also provides income for the rural areas, and this has an effect throughout the whole society and uh, the social structure in these areas. So cassava is a rural crop. It's going to be grown in these rural areas. Uh, by primarily by smaller farmers, okay? There'll be some large plantations uh, based around some of the industry. But the, for, the smaller farmer will also play a very important role in this. And if you look at it, even where there are large, larger plantations, let's say in southern Brazil, they are, these factories are still receiving 70 or even more percent of their roots from the smaller farmers. Uh, so the uh, the fact that cassava has become somewhat of an industrial crop, I think an indication that economically in the, this is going to be a benefit for the rural areas and for the rural workforce, and that includes a lot of women being employed in these, in these uh, processing plants for cassava. And how do you feel in, in 30 seconds or less, uh, how do you feel about um, um, the, the, the sort of pest and disease pressure on cassava now in Southeast Asia? Do you think we're, we're moving fast enough to tackle the problem? Yes, I think uh, right now there's a lot of concern, okay, uh, I know uh, here at SEAD, uh, even IITA has played a role, and in the national programs in the region in, in Asia, this is the key, okay, is that the national programs in the region are, uh, are aware of what the problems are and can help and can do something about this type of thing. Thailand is a good example. They reacted very rapidly to this. They were very successful in what they had done. It's a model, I think, for the rest of Asia. Okay? And, and uh, so I think, yes, I feel confident that we can do something in Asia. We're not going to eliminate the problem. But, and and uh, we can help prevent more problems from entering, and we can reduce the significance of the, of the pest and diseases on, the, on cassava yields in Asia.